Okay, well, thank you, Bruce, and um, the organizers for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I'll tell you about work that I've been doing in Tyler Jacks's lab at the Koch Institute at MIT. So the disease that I'm particularly interested in is small cell lung cancer. Lung cancer continues to um, be the number one cause of cancer-related mortality um, in the United States, and among lung cancer subtypes, small cell lung cancer is a particularly lethal and challenging disease. It accounts for about 13% of all lung cancers. It's a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma that's highly metastatic and often metastatic at the time of presentation. Here are some examples of um, disease that's already involving the mediastinal lymph nodes and um, met metastases in the brain. It's characterized by an impressive initial response to chemotherapy, but um, almost invariably relapses. And when it does, it's um, very difficult to treat with subsequent lines of therapy. And as a result, the median survival for this disease is on the order of one year. And in fact, treatment um, options for this disease have basically been unchanged for the past 30 years. Um, and, and what I'm interested in is developing systems that uh, may be used for better predicting new therapeutics for this disease. So what I'll do today is introduce you to a genetically engineered mouse model that we use to study small cell lung cancer in the lab, and then talk about um, an interesting story that we're developing in collaboration with um, Jeff Engelman's group to study a combination therapeutic strategy to treat small cell lung cancers and then um, show you some of our early um, in vivo data use, using our genetically engineered mice to test this strategy. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, our research platform is a genetically engineered mouse model of small cell lung cancer. Um, these animals are engineered such that they carry um, um, LOXP or FLOXED um, alleles of two key tumor suppressor genes, RB1 and P53. And this is a model that was actually originally developed by the Burns Lab in about 10 years ago. Um, these flox alleles are actually fully functional. Let's see if I can, there we go. These are fully functional in every cell um, of, the, of the animal um, until we introduce a uh, Cree recombinase. And this enzyme works to um, act on these LOXP sites to uh, delete key portions of these genes and leave these genes left in inactive form. And we direct Cre recombinase to specific cell types by actually introducing it via an adenoviral vector intratracheally into these mice, um, and actually specifically then direct Cre expression to neuroendocrine cells in the lung. And by doing this, we're able to specifically delete these genes just in pulmonary um, neuroendocrine cells. When we do that, um, the mice do eventually develop uh, tumors in the lungs, and uh, this happens over the course of about 10 to 12 months. So these are key initiating events, but I'll show you that these are not the only events needed to um, develop these tumors. When they do become evident, these tumors are um, detectable as masses in the lung. This is a CT scan showing an enlarging tumor in the lung of a mouse. This is just the heart here. And when we look at these histologically, they very nicely model the histologic properties of human small cell lung cancer. And I'll show you some more detail on that. I'll just take a, a, an aside here to mention that the reason we think this is a very powerful preclinical model um, is because these tumors develop in the context of the normal lung environment. They have normal um, tumor microenvironment. They interact with the immune system. Um, and we think that because of this, they may be um, more accurate preclinical models than, for example, xenografts that have traditionally been used to um, test therapeutics um, for this disease. Okay, so we can look at lesions um, as they develop in the lungs, and these are early lesions. This is an early lesion developing in the airway here by h &E stain and a corresponding section uh, stained for CGRP, which is a neuroendocrine marker. And Here's a more advanced invasive lesion um, in the lung parenchyma, which is again retaining its neuroendocrine identity with a CGRP stain. We can also appreciate that these lesions are, like the human disease, highly metastatic. So here's a, an advanced lesion in the lung, which actually has a necrotic core, um, spreading um, via lymphangitic spread to the mediastinum and then hematogenously to the liver. We can also follow these tumors as they progress over time in the animal. So this is a very nice example that we have of an MRI of a particular animal followed over time, where you can see an enlarging tumor in the lung. 
and corresponding images of the liver initially look clean, but then if you follow those over time, you can see these growing metastases here, so just as we see in the human condition. Work by David McFadden in our lab has um, uncovered some of the genomic changes that these tumors undergo, and what we find is that in addition to the p53 and RB loss that we engineer into these tumors, they also acquire other mutations and alterations, including amplification of um, LMIC and NF1B, common amplification seen in the human disease as well, and a variety of point mutations. Um, and I'm, the point of showing you this is not at all to show you the particular genes that are mutated. Instead, to show you that if you look at a spectrum of tumors here, they each have their own unique collection of um, point mutations and alterations, which I think um, also models what we see in human disease and may become relevant as we think about using these um, tumors in preclinical therapeutic studies. Okay, so thinking about therapies, there have been a variety of um, signaling pathways um, and processes that have been described in small cell lung cancer um, cells and, uh, and cell lines. And I'm not going to go into the details of these other than to say that there have been many different pathways that have been targeted with a variety of agents, and unfortunately a large number of phase one and phase two clinical trials have all been negative to date. The pathway that I'm going to focus on a little bit more today is a pathway involving um, the anti-apoptotic um, family of BCL2 proteins. So you saw a schematic that looked a lot like this earlier today by Jeff Engelman. And uh, this work is, in fact, uh, work that we've developed in collaboration with his group. So this schematic is here to, to give you a refresher on the basics um, of uh, the induction of apoptosis in the cell. Uh, this is uh, the mitochondria schematized here. Um, and apoptosis really comes down to the um, homodimerization of BACs and back at the mitochondrial membrane, which allows for release of cytochrome C. Now, the, the dimerization of these, is, or the um, oligomerization of these, I should say, is, is triggered and activated by BIM, which is a pro-apoptotic, which is in turn held in check by a series of anti-apoptotic proteins, including BCL2 and BCLXL and MCL1. Now, Abbott 263 or Navidoclax is a, um, a drug that acts to inhibit the activity of BCL2 and BCLXL by sequestering it away from BIM. And the idea behind this is that uh, that would potentially free up BIM to then activate apoptosis in, in um, target cells. And in fact, um, this, this compound was tested in a panel of small cell lung cancer xenograft models and showed a lot of preclinical promise, and there was a lot of excitement for using this in patients. Fortunately, when this moved into clinical trials, um, what was found was that there was um, really not a very impressive response among patients in a phase two trial. So um, you can see the waterfall plot here, very different than one of some of the plots that we've seen earlier today. And because of this, this um, compound is no longer being um, uh, moved forward in small cell lung cancer. So Tony uh, Faber in Jeff Engelman's lab was interested in um, why this was the case, and he looked at um, BIM and MCL1 levels in a panel of small cell lung cancer cell lines compared to other tumors, and what he found was that small cell lung cancer cell lines tended to express higher levels of BIM and also higher levels of MCL1. And in fact, when he looked at um, the amount of apoptosis in these uh, cell lines, um, in, when he compared that to MCL1 and BIM levels, he found that the cells that had the highest levels of BIM and the lowest levels of MCL1 were the ones that were most sensitive to Abbott 263. Why is this important? This suggests that perhaps MCL1 is a key um, uh, factor that may prevent Abbott 263 from being active, and if we had a way to inhibit um, MCL1 activity, then perhaps that would allow Abbott 263 to be active in these cells. So he tested this hypothesis um, by actually using um, an mTORC inhibitor. Um, mTORC1, as it turns out, is required for phosphorylation of 4-ABP1, which then um, in some cell types um, helps um, to uh, induce translation of the MCL1 transcript. So if you inhibit mTORC1, this can reduce uh, MCL1 protein levels in some cell types, and it's not clear why this is active in some and not others. But what he found is that when he looked at a panel of small cell lung cancer cell lines, in fact, by administering AZD8055, the TORC inhibitor, he did see reduction in MCL1 levels, and this was seen in a panel of um, different cell lines. So the idea, again, is that if you combine Abbott 263 and AZD8055, you can fully free up BIM to um, enable BACs and BAC 
um, oligomerization and um, induction of apoptosis. And what he found is that this was in fact the case when he looked at human small cell lung cancer cell lines that there was um, in synergistic induction of apoptosis shown in black um, in a panel of different cell lines when he combined these two compounds. And this effect was abrogated by overexpression of MCL1. So we went on to look at this in our mouse cell lines um, to try to understand whether we could expect the same results in our mouse lines. And what we found was that indeed in a series of our mouse lines, we saw a really dramatic effect by combining these two compounds. Um, this is a, a dose response curve of AZD8055, where the red curves show um, no addition of Abbott 263, and in the blue, uh, we do add Abbott 263. And you can see that uh, the addition of Abbott 263 really dramatically reduces viability in a series of these lines. And um, we've also shown that this is um, via um, mechanism of apoptosis. What's very interesting, I think, as a, just a sidebar, is that we don't see this in all of our cell lines. We only see it in a subset. And, and if you look um, not so carefully, it becomes very obvious very quickly at which cell types are sensitive and which aren't. You see a very obvious difference. The ones that are most sensitive are the ones that um, tend to grow as non-adherent neurospheres in the dish. And they also, if you look at gene expression, tend to express neuroendocrine markers such as MASH1, synaptophysin, and EPCAM. Now, this is in contrast to lines that grow adherent to the dish and have very mesenchymal appearing properties, and in fact, express very high levels of mesenchymal markers such as vimentin and SNAIL, um, and are absolutely insensitive to the um, addition of Abbott 263. Um, these two lines that I'm showing you here are in fact derived from the same mouse tumor are, and are in fact clonally related pairs, and we've shown that by sequencing. So really it looks like there's some um, effect of an epithelial mesenchymal transformation on the sensitivity to this combination therapy, and that's something that we're very much interested in pursuing. Okay, so what about testing this in mice? I'm going to show you two different examples of how we uh, have been testing this approach in mice. The first is um, what we are describing as gem-derived allograft system. This is analogous to a patient-derived xenograft. Um, and the reason that we do this is because, as I showed you earlier, the tumors that develop in our small cell model, um, in fact, each develop their own unique set of genetic alterations. So what we'd like to do is to be able to take a single tumor, effectively clone it into a series of animals, and then test the effects of compounds in that cloned tumor. Um, we, uh, we like the idea of this um, as opposed to doing um, mouse um, transplants or xenograft transplants because these, um, these tumors in the, oops, back up, in the way that we do this, have never seen plastic. They've never been grown in tissue culture, and therefore they've never been undergone any, any sort of selection in culture um, or other alterations that um, tissue culture can induce. So um, when we do this, we find that we can actually um, very nicely clone tumors um, it, histologically, and we're looking into whether these, in fact, maintain the same um, genomic and um, gene expression uh, characteristics. And um, then when we test our, our compounds then in a series of cloned tumors, what we find is uh, much as we would expect that a uh, combination of Abbott 263 and AZD8055 really potently induces um, cleaved caspase 3 or apoptosis, um, as you can see here, and also importantly reduces the, um, the phosphohistone H3 staining, which is a marker of mitosis. So we think we're also, we're inducing both um, apoptosis and an inhibition of uh, mitosis in these tumors. This is an example of one um, uh, gem-derived allograft um, series of tumors where two of the tumors were treated um, with the combination therapy and two were untreated. And what you could see is that the untreated tumors continued to grow in size, whereas the treated ones really dramatically regressed. And when we looked histologically after only 14 days, what you can see is that um, the tumor that regressed really uh, was almost fully replaced by a fibrotic stroma, whereas the untreated one continued to maintain a very nice, um, healthy, uh, uh, small cell lung cancer appearing histology. Um, looking overall at the tumors that we've treated so far with this gem-derived allograft system, you can see that the ones that have um, received the combination therapy have responded much better than the ones that have not. However, um, if you break this down into the different uh, tumor clones, what you can then appreciate is that, for example, tumor one has been much more responsive to the therapy than tumor two or tumor three. And the reason for this is unclear, but we think that the gem-derived allograft system actually may give us a nice um, mechanism or sort of um, way of testing 
um, hypotheses for why this may be the case. So we can, uh, we're now moving to doing, um, for example, RNA sequencing on um, these tumors compared to these and these to try to understand what are the gene expression differences that underlie this difference in sensitivity. And this is important because, again, thinking about moving combinations like this into patients, we want to be able to predict in advance who are the patients who are going to be best suited to respond. I'll just end by giving you um, a little bit of um, an example of what we're starting to see when we test this in the autochthonous model, so in the mice that actually um, develop the tumors in the lungs. And, um, you know, we're interested in, in seeing the range of response in these animals is, uh, in parallel to doing our gem-derived allograft studies. And um, when we test our compounds in these animals, so far we've seen some um, very nice responses. This is an example that's sort of hard to see up here. Again, it may be easier to see on the um, screens on the side. But there's um, a tumor here that after 28 days of treatment is really dramatically regressed. And then another example here of a tumor um, in this lung here that then again has undergone significant regression after 28 days. So this is a very nice example of tumors responding to a therapy in this model. And this is a mouse, a genetically engineered mouse model where um, therapeutics really haven't been um, tested in any successful way. So we think that this um, shows some promise for moving this approach forward. And again, we're hoping that we can use this system to try to identify what are the factors that make tumors best poised to respond to this therapy. So I'll summarize what I've told you today. Um, I've shown you that conditional deletion of p53 and RB1 um, to key tumor suppressor genes in pulmonary epithelial cells in mice actually initiates tumors that model the histologic, molecular, genetic, and clinical features of small cell lung cancer. We're exploring a new therapeutic approach using combination BH3 mimetic therapy and mTOR inhibition to induce apoptosis and growth inhibition in human and mouse small cell lung cancer cell lines. And when we look in vivo, both through these subcutaneous gem-derived allografts and in the native lung environment in our autochthonous models, we can see that tumors do demonstrate sensitivity to the combination therapy strategy. Um, and we're hoping that we'll be able to use this preclinical system to um, really define how best to design a clinical trial with, um, for example, this therapy or other similar therapies moving forward. So um, I'd like to thank my, um, and my advisor, Tyler Jackson, and others in the lab. And again, all of this uh, work that I showed you with the combination therapy has been a collaboration with Tony Faber in Jeff Engelman's lab. Thank you. I guess the other model might be growing tumors directly from patients and, and, and uh, immunocompromised mice. Have you tried that or to compare with your, uh, your genetic, genetic model? Yeah, so we are <coughs> doing that. There, there is um, a group led by a group at Hopkins that's, that is starting to develop a series of patient-drive xenografts for small cell lung cancer. It's challenging because um, this is a disease that's um, very rarely surgically resected, so there's not a lot of right. sample available. Okay, um, so you have to work very closely with the, um, the, either the biopsy team or a surgical team to try to get tissue for that. Um, again, that uh, does some, have some advantages over traditional xenografts in that those cells have never been cultured in a dish. However, they're still then grown in an immune-compromised animal. Um, may or may not be relevant really for this type of therapeutic strategy, but for others where the interplay with the immune system and the tumor microenvironment are really relevant, um, the uh, genetically engineered model may offer some advantages. Yes? So, uh, I don't know if you were here this morning or not, but... Mm -hmm. Essentially, every drug that's known that can affect this disease, and not necessarily throwing them all in it at once in patients, but some combination, combinatorial type approach. But here, you could just ask the question. You could take everything that we've heard about and treat this illness simultaneously. Do you affect any different outcome? Is that something you're talking about in your lab? You mean doing it directly in the mice? Yeah. or? <clears throat> So I think it's a theoretical possibility. Um, it, it, it actually is not as trivial as it may seem in, in theory. <laughs> Are you thinking about doing it? Well, I think um, uh, we're thinking about doing it with a more directed approach, not, not so broadly. I think that it would require a large infrastructure to do on the scale that you're indicating, and that's something that may not really be possible to do in an academic lab with the resources that we have, um, because it would just require so many mice and so much resources, but I think it's a great idea if, um, if there are the resources available to do it. 
Okay, two more questions. I had a question about your combination studies that you did with the BCL2 inhibitor and the mTOR inhibitor. Yep. We saw synergy. If you substituted an allosteric mTOR, mTOR inhibitor or a PI3 kinase inhibitor, would you see the same result? So I don't know about the allosteric inhibitor. Um, the PI3 kinase inhibitor, I, uh, I believe Tony has done those, and I think he has not seen that same synergy with the PI3 kinase inhibitor. Lou, did you have a question? Yeah. <clears throat> so in your model, or in general in the mouse models that are now engineered to be at least some of the lesions that are recurrent in human tumors, what is the findings on the heterogeneity within an individual mouse? Do you see the degree, if you do really deep sequencing, do you see these subclones that we see basically every time we look in humans? Yes. So, in fact, we do see um, a, a large, um, a great deal of heterogeneity within individual tumors, and we can identify subclones, for example, in a primary tumor that then become um, uh, clonally amplified in a, in a metastasis within a single mouse. Um, so that same process of heterogeneity within a primary tumor and then clonal selection in metastases occurs in our mouse models. That's wonderful. Make yeah. some better models. Yeah. Very powerful models. Okay, we better go on to the last uh, talk. We're a few minutes late.